I want to thank you all for coming here tonight on such a wintry night as tonight is. Yeah. <laughs> I hope this is not uh, setting us up for bad things to come. But uh, tonight I want to try to share with you uh, um, everything I know, all the knowledge I have of this man, Samuel Boyd, and why he's characterized as the father of our city. And I think after the presentation, you'll probably, I hope, end up agreeing with me that he is indeed the father of our city when you see everything that I have to say. All right, let's get into uh, why is this man called the father of our city. Um, Sam Boyd was born on Walker Street, June 2nd, 1815. He was the sixth of 11 children of John and Sof Sophia Boyd. His uh, ancestors came over here in 1636 uh, and settled in Boston. His grandfather, uh, fought in the Revolutionary War. Uh, we think the house that he was born in, that the two generations of Boyd's was born in, is this house here, but we're not 100% sure. It's on the corner of River Street and, uh, and uh, Walker Street. This being River Street here, and this is Walker Street here. But we're not 100% sure of that. Uh, it could have been a house that's uh, where uh, the old Inland Express, as a lot of us know, or somewhere around there, because there's new buildings. Uh, all it says uh, in the history of him is that it's, it was on Walker Street near Maple Street. So it doesn't say on the corner or anything like that. But uh, he was, uh, he had a very limited education, very limited. He, uh, maybe he was lucky if he went uh, maybe a few weeks in the winter time to school. Uh, and then he, he, he was fortunate enough that he, he got to do one to two terms at the Marlboro Academy, uh, which was also called Gates Academy, which would have been where the Walker Building is on Main Street now. Uh, and it was built back in the 1800s. And he, uh, he, he was being taught under the great teacher, Old W. Albee, who was, uh, if you go through the history books, especially in education, that's all you see is about Old W. Albee. He lived in a brick house. It's the oldest brick house left in marble on the corner of Central and Mechanic Street. It's still there. I think it's a multi-family house now. But that's where uh, Old W. Albee lived. He went off at age 14 to apprentice. Uh, and uh, he did that with uh, a fellow named, uh, uh, from Northville, uh, named, um, I lost his name, Colonel Joseph Davis, uh, who's brother was the governor of Massachusetts at the time. So he spent uh, seven years under the tutelage of uh, Joseph Davis, learning the tannin and courier business and other parts of the business uh, to learn it. When he was ready to uh, go into business for himself, into the shoe business, uh, he was warned uh, that the farming town of Marble was no place for him to perform his trade. His ambitious reply was, and I want you to remember this. Other men in other towns have stayed at home and helped build up their native place. And that is what I propose to do. And uh, you're going to see that he was a man of his words about that. You know, in 1836, uh, prior to him starting up in the shoe industry, Marble was a farming town. The Marble's principal product to ship to other towns was cider brandy. Uh, we had a lot of apple trees here, so that was the big thing they made. Outside of that, they were pretty self-sufficient. They had grist and sawmills, uh, coopers, blacksmiths, tinsmiths, basket makers, two or three general stores. So they really didn't need anything else, but uh, that was the major industry, uh, was uh, shipping off uh, cider brandy. So the... Uh, he started in March of 1836 making shoes at 85 Maple Street. 85 Maple Street is still standing. It's right across the street from the American Legion on Maple Street. You can't miss it. Uh, when, he, when he started there, he started with his brother Joseph in a 20 by 30 L, which is like an addition, a side thing of the house. And uh, it was probably towards the back here. Uh, around over here, back in here. And uh, 
his, his brother had started it in 1835, and his brother had tutored and learned his trade from Colonel Ephraim Howe of Marlboro, who was the leading shoemaker in Marlboro in the early 1800s. Prior to 1836, and Samuel Boyd coming upon this, the scene, they were just individual shoemakers that made the shoes in their homes, in what they called 10 footers, 10 by 10 buildings. And they would make one shoe at a time. It would take them forever. And also, and they'd go around to people's houses and take orders. And sometimes they'd stay at the person's house for a week while they were making shoes for the family, you know, because they wouldn't be back. So sometimes little Johnny had to wear the shoes for, you know, while well, he was five years old, six years old, seven years old, eight years old. So uh, uh, he was the leading shoemaker until Samuel Boyd came along. But um, he, uh, he uh, revolutionized, as you're going to find out, the shoe industry. Uh, by 1837, he needed more room already. And he had this idea that uh, instead of one person making the shoes, that maybe we could get teams of you know, more people making shoes. One's making the soles, one making the last, one making this, and so forth, and then put them together. You know, sort of as Henry Ford did years later in the auto industry. He kind of brought that, that on in the shoe industry. And uh, he built on 45 Maple Street, which I don't believe this is the same building he built, but it's right here. Uh, an accountant owns the building and has his practice down here, McAllister. And I believe his son, uh, Kevin, is, has a lot for him up on the second floor. And... Uh, and he, uh, he in, there, in there, he made uh, different parts of the shoe. I believe it was the, uh, the sole leathers and the bottom work was done in this building here. Then what he did was he rented a room in this building at 30 Maple Street, which is right across, right in this building here, right across the street from uh, 45 Maple Street. And over there, he was... Uh, had people where they, uh, they made the uppers, they cut them out and they made them up. And then he took those and brought them back to his original place on Maple Street and put the shoes together, had people to put them together. So uh, you could see how he started the mass production of shoes uh, at an early, early stage. Joseph, his brother, retired in 1839 and moved to St. Louis. Now, Joseph, in all the history book things I've read about Joseph, was a very small man in stature, the same as Sam Boyd, but Sam was a little bit taller than him, but he was barely over four feet tall, Joseph was. But uh, Sam, Sam was a little man. They talk about him in different times. As, for a small man, he had such a large heart and a large brain and so forth, things like that. So uh, maybe it was just the family were, were just all small like that, but I'm not sure. He moved to St. Louis because he wanted to, that was the outpost at the time. And he wanted to find out what was going on there and other parts and down south. He traveled all around trying to find out what needs were in the shoe industry so he would know that. So it was very important. His brother John in 1841 joined uh, Samuel in, uh, in, partners, in a partnership. In 1842, John invents the shoe dye which really gave an upper edge to Sam Boyd and to the shoe industry in general in Marvel because no one else had the dye. The dye, you see it right up here, there's a couple of them on the table up here you can look at after. They were used to cut out the patents and everything. And it was very quick, they just take a big mallet hand, hammer and bang over the, the leather and cut it right out. And that really, and it got to be more uniform than doing it by hand, trying to cut it out by hand. So. Uh, that gave him a real upper edge. So between mass production, the shoe dye, <clears throat> he really had the upper edge on a lot of other shoe factories and a lot of other communities. Now, you've got to remember back then, uh, they were start, just starting up in Milford, in Lynn, in Haverhill. They were, the, the shoe industry was starting up too. So uh, he needed more room then because of all what was happening. So uh, he built what's called the uh, common shop. You're going to be shocked when you see where this was. John Rose Funeral Home. That's why they call it the Commons Shop, because it was right next to the Commons, down in front of the first church. And uh, 
So he moved into there because uh, they were so busy. He had the others that he kept going though too. So <clears throat> he, uh, Joseph returned and took the place of John. Uh, he did have numer he had uh, other brothers that would work there every so often, but uh, John played an important part because John, as I said, invented the shoe dye, which gave him a big uh, uh, advantage. And uh, he, so he played a big part of it. But Joseph now returned, you know, and to, from learning everything from being out west, down south, traveling around the country, what the people's needs were and so forth. So he brought all this information back with him. So he played a very important role in that. Uh, in 1849, he partnered with Thomas Corey and built the Corey shop, the corner shop, I'm sorry, on Maple Street, which became Boyd and Corey. There it is right there. You would know it today as a laundromat. All right. This is Maple Street over here, and this is Main Street right here. And there's a laundromat there right now. It used to be a gas station. That was the first Boyd and Corey shop with the two of them in business. And uh, so uh, they were there for quite a while. And then uh, he moved on. And, you know, uh, he uh, was so getting bigger and bigger and bigger. He, he said, he came up with the idea, we're going to make shoes in teams of 12. So he took 12 people from start, you know, one, one person would be at the very beginning and so forth all the ways up and they'd have a shoe done. So instead of waiting a week to have a pair of shoes done, they were pouring out pairs of shoes like you can't believe every day in their teams of 12 in all their different factories. Then he needed more space as you can see here in 1855, so he built what's called the brick shop on Main Street. And then he went on in 1858 and built Boyd's Block on Main Street, uh, which is, this was the brick shop right here, and this was Boyd's Block here. I'm just going to go back here and tell you, in 1865, Thomas Corey retired and went south and re-entered the firm in 1868. I tried to find out why he went south, but I, it could have been because he was going down there to, uh, you know, because of the Civil War and whatever, because they were doing an awful lot of business during the Civil War, uh, both with the North and the South. A lot of the shoe firms up here weren't supposed to be doing business with the South, but the money went, won out over that in a lot of cases, and they were. So uh, then in 1866, they needed more room. He built a 40-foot connection to join the two buildings together where today's Corey building stands. So he built this 40-foot connection. Today, you would know this as that right there, the Corey building on Main Street in the corner of Florence and Main. Of course, that's not, that's not this building here. As you can tell, they had a major fire here. They had another fire here. Had a lot of fires back then. Most of the places were made out of wood, although this was made out of brick. We have a picture upstairs in our archives of a major fire to this building here uh, that was completely demolished from the fire. Even that wasn't big enough. <laughs> he kept, they kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So he built a large factory at the corner of Howe and Main Streets, which eventually became the largest in the country. There it is right there. It was, uh, there were five floors, one, two, three, four, in the basement, which was kind of exposed on Howe Street. Howe Street was over here, and this was Main. This is Bolton Street right here, and the fire station would have been, it wasn't built then, but it would have been built right here in the early 1900s. So, next picture is kind of blurry. It's an old, old, old picture that Joan Abshire found, and uh, which tried to, get it to come out as good as possible, but we weren't able to. It's taken from the top of Town Hall, the old Town Hall that, that burnt down and, uh, uh, and then we had to build the City Hall, but uh, it's kind of blurry, but it gives you a side view from the Town Hall clock. This is looking down like that, and this would have been Howe Street down here, so it's the additions and it kept going back and back and back. So it was the, uh, back then, it was the largest uh, shoe factory uh, in the country. It had uh, about 50,000 square feet. 
Today, that's nothing. But back then, it was a lot. It was a lot. And uh, this is where today, this is Chin's Garden here. And this is the parking lot here. This is where the building was right here, right there, to give you an idea. They were so successful, uh, the Boyd and Corey, that uh, even the Japanese got wind of them. <laughs> and they got visited on August 5th, 1872, by the Japanese embassy from Washington to visit the, the factory to view the efficiency of producing shoes in volume. Because all around the world, they weren't mass producing shoes. It was still being made by one person here, one person there. But it wasn't being mass produced. So they came all the ways up to take a look and, uh, and they paid a visit. They, they spent most of the day there in August 5th, 1872. Unfortunately, in 1874, Thomas Corey, his partner, died, uh, which was, must have been a sad day for him. Uh, from everything I've read, they were very close, very, very close, very good friends. Besides being business partners, they were very, very good fr uh, friends So, uh, and very successful. Both of them were very, very successful. So uh, that must have been very hard on Samuel Boyd when that happened. But... Uh, it's, um, he carried on, he carried on the business and left the name Boyd and Corey. He didn't take Corey's name out of it after Thomas Corey died, but he kept, kept, go kept it going as Boyd and Corey. Just to give you some statistics, when he started business in 1836, the population of Marble was around 1800. That also included Hudson. Hudson was part of Marble then, all right? In 1855, it grew to 4288, 19 years after he started. You know, when he first started, they were making uh, children's shoes. Most of the early shoemaking was children's shoes, which you'll see some up here on the table. We have some uh, that have been donated to us. You can take a look after, at them after. And uh, in 18, you know, it was closer to around the 1860s when they started producing boots and and uh, adult shoes and so forth. The population grew to 5,810. 1866, when Hudson was established, it lost 1,800 of its people. By 1890, when Marlboro became a city, it had grown to 13,000 people. And that was because of the Boyd start in the shoe industry. And everybody else, a lot of people that worked for them, they went and they started up their own factories, uh, a lot of major factories around the country uh, from people that worked under him that learned to trade from them and went on to out on their own and so forth. But you can see how fast it grew in, in, 64, in 54 years. You know, it was one of the major reasons why Marlboro became a city in 1890. Because of the growth of it, because of how busy it became, you know, and you know, back then being a city was uh, meant a little bit more than a town, you know, and so forth. So, uh, you know, so it played a vital, vital importance uh, in, in importance in in us becoming a city. In 1845, the total values of shoes produced was only 92,000, almost 93,000 dollars. By 1890, the to total produced at his factory alone was a million five hundred thousand dollars. Now that's in 1890, so that's 122 years ago. So equated in today's figures, that would be quite a bit. That would be up in the hundreds of millions. In 1875, the average capital invested in value of product per establishment, Marlboro outstripped the much larger towns of Lynn and Haverhill by far, by far. They had more people working in the shoe industry, but they didn't, they didn't have them in teams and so forth. They weren't mass producing like we were. They were, uh, you know, they were bigger than us. They had more shoe factories than us, but they had less people working in them. They hadn't got that together. They didn't have the shoe dye that his brother had invented and so forth. So he, they, we really had the upper edge on these, on these uh, other other communities that, be, that were big shoe producing communities. 
You know, they were, you know, uh, Milford, Lynn, Brockton, Haverhill, Marble. We were all the, some of the major shoe producers in the Northeast, and then others like in uh, where there was rivers and so forth, like Lawrence and those places. They were more into mills, you know, cotton and and things like that. So, uh, but we outstripped them all by far. I can't really by far. And it's, it's, as I stated earlier, in 1879, it was reported that the largest shoe factory in the country was the Boyd and Corey factory on Main Street. So even though it was only 50,000 square feet, it still was the largest in the country. So uh, that's quite, a, quite an accomplishment. He really believed in giving back to the city, to the city of Marlboro. So, his factory office was a counting office or a savings bank for the town up until the Marble Savings Bank was founded in 1860. So he was acting like the, the bank for the town, for the town government, for everybody. He was, his office was the counting office and the savings bank combined. He promoted and financed the agricultural branch, branch railroad. This is quite a story. It started at Marble Junction. If none of you know where Marble Junction is, it's down at the Marble Southville line, uh, down by the old Trotton Park, yeah. all right, down there, uh, is a junction. The, the, the rail goes off to Westboro there, but it used to come right up, uh, right into downtown Marble, right behind where the uh, Savings Bank was on the corner of Main and, and Florence Street, right behind there. It came up to there, and uh, to this here. This was the depot. This is the old town hall right here. That's where that picture was probably taken from of the, of the factory. But this was the, uh, the railroad depot, and they had a freight depot in the back. He had to go through quite a bit to get that uh, done because the politicians in Boston that represented Haverhill and Lynn and all these other places was trying to block him because that was the one advantage they had over him, over Marble, was they had easier way to ship to Boston to ship their goods out because everything got shipped into Boston to get shipped to down south, out west, wherever, overseas, wherever it was going. So they were tying them, tying them up to every what way. You know what Sam Boyd did? He said to hell with them and he built it anyways, on his own. And he raised some money from other private people in Marlboro and he built it on his own. And finally, two years later, the, the legislature at the, finally he says, well, it's already in. <laughs> so they approve it <laughs> two years after the fact. But if he didn't take it, pull by the horn and do it, it never would have happened. So by, by building it, and things got built a lot faster back then, uh, it, it gave them that, <clears throat> that advan took away the advantage that Lynn and the other communities had. So he took quite a risk in doing it, but that's the way he was, you know. Uh, he would take a risk like that to, uh, to get things done. He promoted a local gas company. Uh, he did this so he could have uh, for his factory, to light his factory, the gas lights and so forth. Also for sale, he was a real entrepreneur, this man, for sale to the general public. Unfortunately, the first two years into it was a new thing. Uh, his barn, which you'll see a picture of later, burnt to the crown, <laughs> his own barn. And like he had said, thank God it was my barn and not one of our customers' <laughs> barns. But, uh, so, but he, he started the first gas company around here. Uh, he uh, began a company to supply the town with water from Lake, Lake Williams. This is Lake Williams back in the turn of the century. That's an old ice house up here. This is the pump station down here. This everybody I think knows. Mm. And everybody's asking me today, where's the top of the <laughs> water tank? I must have had six people ask me today, where's the top? <laughs> Does anybody know? Because <laughs> I don't know. I know they're renovating it. Uh, I think it's about a three quarters of a million dollar renovation to it that they're working on. So they probably disassembled it to do something and putting it back up. Uh, and uh, this would, would be where the courthouse is today, right here, is where the courthouse would be, right, right, well, more like right there today. So he started it four years later to finally to select, he ran his own private water company and started putting in the pipes and all that. Of course, there were wooden pipes back then. but. Uh, finally, the selectmen voted, hey, this is a pretty good idea, maybe the town should be running it. And they voted and he just gave it what he had done over to them and they took over the, the water, the water uh, system in Marvel. 
Uh, he erected an indoor skating rink on Fairmont Street, right behind, would be right behind where the Masonic Building is today. It would have been right behind that. And he built this skating rink for the pleasure of people. It didn't last too long, maybe two years, and it kind of, the fad died off, and he made it into a public hall where they had public meetings and things like that. And then uh, he sold it to a good friend of his, uh, someone named F.W. Riley, who was like a conductor of music, into music and so forth. And he started Marlboro's first theater. So it was the first Marlboro theater there. And uh, long gone, of course, got torn down many, many, many years ago. One of his biggest feats that he ever did was build the Electric Street Railway. He really thought that he had built the first in the country when he built it, only to find out that he got beat by two weeks by, um, it's still kind of unclear whether it was Baltimore or Richmond, Virginia, but uh, he, he got beat anyways. And he was the second electric uh, uh, trolley system in the country. And uh, there you can see a trolley going up Main Street around the turn of the century here. Right there, they had rebuilt the depot. You saw a picture of the old, old depot. They tore it down and built this new depot. And there's the quarry building. So this is in the early 1900s, because this got built in the, right around the turn of the century. And uh, this here was the Princess Theater. And this building right here, you can just barely see, is the building of the big fire last year that burnt down to the ground. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. The big fire, everyone remembers that fire. So. Uh, that the trolley system started from Marble Junction, which I showed you earlier, where the train th trains came from, and came up Maple Street. On Maple Street, where the fire station, today's fire station is, was the, one of the car barns. You had a car barn there for the, uh, that the uh, trolleys would go in to get fixed and turn around and repairs and stuff like that. He also had one across the street later on uh, where McDonald's is basically that base, that area, general area. He also built one there. A big big house on the corner of uh, of uh, Madison Street and Maple. A big house as his uh, foreman that ran the uh, the trolley system. That was for him. He built a lot of big houses for his foreman of the factories. A lot of big houses you see in Marble uh, are, are just that that the uh, the shoe uh, uh, barons built them for their their foreman. The foremans made good money. The people who worked in the factories didn't make good money, but the foremans made good money. So it came up Maple Street to Main. The first first route was, and then up Main Street. And they had a, they had um, turnoffs, like so, in case the trolley was coming down and this was going up. This could they had a, they had them set apart a different distance, so this one could go over here to the right, and the other one could pass, and then that one would come back out onto the track and go on its way. And then they went up by Monument Square, up Mechanic to Lincoln, took a left on Lincoln, and at the time, the first time it opened, went up to Pleasant, took a left on Pleasant, down to West Main, took a left at West Main, back down the Monument, back down Main Street, and the same thing. Then he did add on, he uh, went farther up Lincoln to Broad, took a left on Broad, down to West Main, and then the left down down West Main, and also had a spur that went up East Main Street. The main reason he built that was that the workers could get to work on time, which was important to him. Plus, they didn't have much time to eat, and a lot of them uh, had to bring uh, pill buckets and things like that to eat, and didn't. You know, a lot of them were complaining they couldn't go home to eat and so forth. Well, they could hop on the trolley for a penny, and maybe they lived up on Broad Street, and they worked at a big factory down there by the, across from the fire station. And they could go up there, have a meal, and come back down, and maybe, I don't know what they got for, maybe a half hour, 45 minutes for lunch, and be able to do that. 